Developments in Egypt, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi face off with terror groups steps up after a court blacklist the armed wing of Hamas. Meanwhile, after 400 days, Al Jazeera journalist Peter Gresta is released back to Australia. Japan is in shock and condemnations all around after the apparent beheading of a Japanese hostage by IS. And with a Jordanian pilot still in the hands of the terror group, Jordan vows to do all in its power to set him free. Israel election 2015 critiques from the right wing claims the Democratic Party is intervening against Netanyahu. But I-24 News discovers the right wing itself getting help from Republican advisors. The News Today with Lucy Aharich. Good evening and welcome to the news today. Tonight we begin in Egypt where President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi seems to be entering a stepped-up face-off uh, face with militants challenging his regime. After, in a particular way, bloody attack on security forces late last week, one that left at least 30 soldiers and police officers dead. Abdel Fattah al-Sisi announced a long and difficult battle with terror ahead, but while the Al-Qaeda-linked Ansar Bayt al-Maktis took responsibility for that attack, the Egyptian president has laid blame squarely on the Muslim Brotherhood blacklisting the military wing of Hamas as a terror group. Also today, though, a somewhat con uh, contradictory uh, development after 400 days in custody, Al Jazeera journalist Peter Gresta was deported back to his home country, Australia, by presidential order. Before we take a look uh, and uh, start discussing these matters, let's take a look back. ده امر هيتكرر انا ما خبيتش عليكم حاجه ان احنا هنقابل موجه ارهاب كبيره قوي لان احنا جينا على تنظيم في اقوى حالات المواجهه دي مواجهه صعبه وقويه وشريره وهتاخد وقت طويل One of our journalists, Peter Grester, has been freed from prison after 400 days behind bars, and he is in good health. We are not going to be able to do it. We are going to be able to do it. And with me tonight to discuss these matters, Senior Middle East Analyst Avi Sakharov, good evening. Good evening, Lucy. Thank you very much for coming. And former Israeli Ambassador to Egypt, Ambassador Eli Shaked, good evening. Thank good you very evening much for you coming. Uh, so, Avi, let's start. If we're talking about, about isolation and the isolation of Hamas, maybe this is the biggest isolation that they can get. Totally. I think that what happened last uh, weekend is that Egypt declared war against Hamas. Yes, it's not going to enter Gaza. It's not going to kill Hamas people. But they, what they are saying is that the armed wing is off limits. They cannot operate in, in uh, Egypt. They cannot do any kind of business in Egypt. And, of course, it affects the way that some, some donor countries are planning to, to supply Hamas with money, like Qatar, like other Gulf countries that might have in their mind the, the supply of money and other goods through Egypt into Gaza Strip. And I think that what Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is saying, our war is not only against the Muslim Brotherhood, but against the radical Islamists wherever they are. And if we're taking this, this is an unprecedented, uh, let's say, uh, saying from an Arab leader in the Arab world. Well, it is getting worse and worse, uh, the, the kind of relations that uh, between Egypt uh, and uh, Gaza and Hamas. But I, I remember that the, the former foreign minister of Egypt, uh, Nabil Fahmi, who said, it was about three or four months ago already, he said in so many words, uh, there might be a possibility that Egyptian military will invade, will get into Gaza. This was uh, after one of the peaks uh, uh, that uh, took place there in northern Sinai. 
And before Egypt started with the, the, the tightening of the siege on, on uh, Gaza, um, I think that um, as far as the war by Assisi against the terrorists in Sinai and in Gaza is concerned, uh, there are no limits. It is an all-out war against terrorism, against a kind of a guerrilla warfare, and um, everything is possible. So before we will continue now to a closer look at the developments in Egypt, here is uh, uh, the following report from I-24 News correspondent Shai Ben Ali. A reminder that this desert storm is yet to pass. The fallout continues from one of the most violent terrorist incidents on Egyptian soil in recent years. 32 were killed in an attack on Egyptian security forces in the northern Sinai Peninsula Thursday night. Four different targets were hit, with most of the casualties occurring in a bombing of a military hotel and base in the town of El Arish. Responsibility for the attack has been claimed by Ansar Beit al Magdis, a jihadist organization based in Sinai which has recently pledged allegiance to the Islamic State terrorist organization. But in the wake of the attacks, the Egyptian president has directed most of his rhetoric at the Muslim Brotherhood. We will witness a big wave of terrorism because we confronted an organization while it was at its strongest, an organization that has been around for many years. It is stable, making plans, ready, and has success around the world. There are countries that are being run today by leaders of this organization. What do you think these states will do? Will they leave us alone? The crisis comes just as relations between rival camps in the region were beginning to thaw, with recent meetings between al-Sisi and Qatari representatives aimed at cooling tensions. These efforts may have now seen a major setback. An Egyptian court ruled on Saturday to ban the Azadin al-Qassam brigades, the military wing of Hamas, openly backed by Qatar, and to list it as a terrorist organization. Hamas, for its part, announced it would no longer accept Egypt as a mediator in Israeli-Palestinian matters and said the court decision only served the, quote, Zionist occupation, unquote. This is a battle. I don't want to say that the countries that face battles against terrorism in Afghanistan, Iraq, and many other places around the world walked away and left terrorism behind. But in Egypt, we will not leave it. No, we will not leave Sinai. We will not leave Sinai to anyone. Either Sinai belongs to Egyptians or we die. But despite the tensions, Sunday saw the long-awaited release of Al Jazeera journalist Peter Grest. After 400 days of imprisonment in an Egyptian jail on charges of aiding a terrorist organization, Al Jazeera is a Qatari-based news network perceived to be pro-Muslim Brotherhood. Grest had applied for deportation under a new law which allows for foreign suspects to be tried or to serve sentences in their native countries. Grest left Egypt for his native Australia Sunday afternoon, but two of his Al Jazeera colleagues, both Egyptian nationals, remain behind bars. Yes, and joining us uh, from Cairo is journalist Annabel van der Berger. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, good evening. So, Annabel, good to see you again. What this means right now in Egypt, this uh, declaration of war against Hamas, and maybe to the people in the Gaza Strip that understands that their regime is not getting any support from the Egyptians? Yeah, what we see is that there is a big division between, of course, the Egyptians in the Sinai and the Egypt Egyptians in the rest of Egypt. So, first of all, people in the rest of Egypt, they are uh, tending not to care too much at this point for the people in Sinai, as at this moment the government and also the state media have um, depicted basically all the inhabitants of the Sinai as terrorists. So, they do not get any support from uh, either the government or even the, the people just in the streets. People are not willing to help the Egyptians in the Sinai at all. And of course, what we've seen after the bomb attack of Friday, the, the, the attack basically at the checkpoint where more than 30 soldiers have died and 25 got injured, um, we've seen that the tension has risen even more and that people um, are even uh, more depicting the, the people in the Sinai as terrorists. And of course, they are in favor of the measures that the government is taking in order to defeat terrorism because people are afraid that Egypt might end up as uh, a country such as uh, Syria and uh, Iraq, where Iraq and Syria are going to at this moment. So uh, let's talk about two things that are going maybe hand in hand and, or maybe not uh, in one way. Uh, let's uh, talk about 
the um, the journalist of Al Jazeera be getting uh, freed today, and this is what this is an answer to uh, to Morsi's people, to the Muslim Brotherhood. Here, we are not against, but we are deporting, and we are not the evil regime that the Muslim Brotherhood is trying to portray. Abdel Fattah al Sisi. Well, first of all, um, the Al Jazeera journalists got in that indeed uh, detained because they supposedly had links with the Al Jazeera network that had supposedly links as well with, a, with the Muslim Brotherhood that was depicted as a terrorist organization um, in September, shortly after Morsi um, lost power in Egypt. Now, um, I wouldn't say that this is entirely an answer to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood it's, uh, showing them that the current regime is more flexible than they are showing. Um, I think it's rather a, a message to the West because after the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris, uh, that were these were an attack on press freedom. We've seen that Egypt has uh, come out as well with the fact that they want to release prisoners as well. Um, and all uh, all of a sudden, we we all thought that indeed the Al Jazeera journalists would at least be freed because they were detained um, for reasons that were not not really uh, verified. Um, it, the process was very vague. The, um, the evidence that there was against these journalists was very vague as well. So we see that um, uh, President Sisi um, felt a bit obliged to uh, release at least Peter Gust at this point and most probably also the other two that are still detained at this moment. Um, so it is basically more an answer to uh, to show the West that th that there is indeed at this moment press freedom. And I would like to add as well that me personally, as a journalist in Egypt, I do feel that it is becoming a little bit less tense at these days. Uh, good to, uh, to hear that, Annabelle. Thank you very very much uh, for your conversation with us. Is it becoming less tense? Is it becoming like can we say that Abdel Fattah al Sisi is managing the situation or starting to manage the situation in Egypt? What we see is a continuing of a war that we had seen for the last year and more since the, the second revolution in Egypt. This war had some successes, I must say, meaning the Egyptian army managed to defeat not only the Muslim Brotherhood inside Egypt, but also some of the ter terrorists in Sinai Peninsula. In the last week, especially around the anniversary, the, the uh, 25th of January, what we had seen is an outburst of the of the Muslim Brotherhood supporters inside Egypt, but also of the terrorists inside Sinai Peninsula. Meaning, maybe yes, he managed to, to calm down the situation, but it's still over there. Although there are some successes, big successes of the Egyptian regime, of the Egyptian army, still the people that are going against this regime, the people that are going against any kind of regime, meaning the terrorists in Sinai are still over there, still managing to kill people, killing soldiers, 29 Egyptian soldiers got killed, and it wasn't just about terrorist attack. It wasn't just some kind of an accidental terrorist attack. That was an operation, almost a military operation conducted by a few different terrorist groups in four different cities simultaneously. If we're looking at it, it's even more horrible than the, 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 the attack that we saw in France uh, on the Charlie Hebdo offices, because that was, like you said, simultaneously uh, uh, attack in four different places against uh, uh, the Egyptian, let's say, regime. And it seems that, that this is a big declaration of war, that Abdus al-Fattah is not going to just say and pass it easy uh, for them. But th the question is, can he really control this situation? He managed. Uh, it takes time, uh, not easy task for, for the Egyptian um, army to uh, get full control over Sinai and uh, stop inside Egypt uh, all the terror uh, uh, activities. Uh, but I am fully confident that in the long run, the Egyptian army will win the war. It's a very tough, as President Sisi said, very tough, very cruel, and it won't be uh, 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 done in an overnight. But in the long run, the Egyptian army is too strong, too big, uh, to be uh, challenged seriously uh, by the terrorists, either by the Hamas or in, in Sinai or in Egypt, wherever it is. Um, uh, we remember the, in the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, when the, uh, there was an organization, an, a horrible terror organization by the name of Attakfir Walhigra, 
they played there a role that was so negative for the Egyptian industry, for the Egyptian tourism economy. Uh, but after, uh, and it was inside Egypt, in Cairo, in Alexandria, in, in, along the Nile. They have managed to stop all the tourism, all the cruises uh, along the Nile. Um, and after several years, the Egyptian army totally eliminated them. It took time. It's not a, an a ordinary war where after a week or, or 50 days, either you win or lose. There is no other way the Egyptians are going to win the war. It, it is very interesting to see that, you know, what surprised me in this attack, it was that although this uh, continuously operation of the Egyptian army in Sinai, although this huge effort that had been done in the last six months, 12 months, still we see some successes from the terrorist groups. Now, the Egyptian army challenges today, or facing today, a few different challenges. One in the west from the Libyan border, meaning the border is open, and yes, terrorists can enter Egypt and can go to Libya, get some weapons, and can go back to, to Egypt. The second one is in Sinai. We have a few hundreds, maybe even thousands of, uh, of terrorists operating against the, the uh, Egyptian army. The estimation is about hundreds of, of terrorists. We have 16 to 18 battalions, different battalions of the Egyptian army located today in Sinai. In Sinai. And I think that the peace accord says that they cannot have a, an army, but they agreed with Israel that they will send all these troops. In the next couple of days, we will see more of them in Sinai. And, and more that you're speaking, mm -hmm. you just uh, mentioned uh, Israel. Let's talk about uh, the, the, this new uh, combination, like this new... Uh, let's say, a new peace agreement that is uh, coming, uh, coming back to life between Israel and uh, Egypt. And it's, it seems that it's even stronger than any time before. And just today, there was a new deal, maybe signed between Noble Energies, the Israeli gas company, to uh, Egypt, which means that there is a lot uh, about a lot the talks between the two, uh, two sides. And, and it seems that there are a lot of uh, interests here to uh, keep um, to, to keep like uh, challenging or keep uh, the two sides uh, together I think that uh, for both sides this cooperation coordination works uh, very well I think that the Egyptians need Israel as much as Israel needs the Egyptians there's one very important dispute between Israel and Egypt and this is about the Palestinians or, or exactly about Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority. They agree upon Hamas. I think that the Egyptians today are even more radical comparing to Israel vis-a-vis -vis Hamas but about the PA and Abbas they completely disagree about that. The Egyptians want Israel to, to do something in order to renegotiate with the Palestinians and they do not see any kind of a future or an horizon with, but, uh, with Israel. But how? I, I, I <clears throat> tend to disagree a bit with, uh, with my friend here. Um, I, I wonder whether there is a, not a kind of lip service that is paid to the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, to Mahmoud Abbas. Um, the Egyptians, they know that they cannot get in the business between Israel and the Palestinians, it's a deadlock. So uh, they are not getting into the business because it seems that the Egyptians were the coordinator uh, they, voice between the Israelis and the Palestinians, at least between the Israelis Israel and Hamas. And Hamas, yes, but not uh, in the the hardcore of the negotiations between Israel or the anticipated uh, talks between Israel and and the Palestinian Authority. Uh, there is no much they can do. Nobody can do much about it at the moment. Uh, so they, they, here and there they talk. But what is important as far as the new, so-called so new relations between Israel and Egypt is the fact that in Cairo they are talking openly about so-called normalization with Israel in specific aspects not in all, uh, it's not going to be the normal kind of relations as between the United States and Canada. But never in the days of Mubarak, 30 years of Mubarak, we have heard anything that uh, uh, on the table openly, as it is now, talking about contacts, coordination with Israel, buying gas from Israel openly. It was never like that. So let's that. talk about this uh, 
contacts uh, that are happening between Israel and the Egyptians openly. Uh, we know that uh, Mohammed Dahlan uh, is really close to the Egyptian regime. We know that the foreign, uh, uh, the, the foreign minister, Israeli foreign minister, met with uh, Mohammed Dahlan. Connect me these two things. I, I think that uh, with all the respect to the foreign affairs minister, uh, Avigdor Lieberman, he was and still is a persona non grata in Cairo. Correct me if I'm wrong. After mm -hmm. the, all he had to say about bombing a swan and uh, some other plans that he had in mind, I think that the bottom line here is still yes, there is some interest, there are some connections, especially about the security coordination. While we are talking, there's an open line today between the commanders of the Egyptian army on the on Sinai Peninsula and the Israeli commanders in, in the the southern region. I heard descriptions of meetings between Israeli generals and Egyptian generals in which the Israeli generals needed to calm down their colleagues from the Egyptian side when they talked about Hamas. Meaning, then again, the Egyptian army is presenting here a very hawkish line towards Hamas. Closing down the tunnels was not a simple operation and they did it. Building a buffer zone of more than a mile, more than a mile buffer zone, destroying 1,200 houses. houses. It's, it's quite inconceivable even to understand that but still Abdel Fattah Sisi gave the order and yes the army is going to do it. So let's see uh, what the, the people in the Gaza Strip think about that. Uh, with me from Gaza Strip is Dr. Hani Bassous, Professor of Political Science and Islamic University of Gaza. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. So it seems that the Egyptians are the bigger enemy for the people in the Gaza Strip than Israel. Well it's not like this at all. I think the Egyptians and the Palestinians have been in, in good contact for the past many years. The only thing happened uh, for the past two years was between Hamas and the Egyptian in new regime, which is led by Sisi. And this kind of antagonism was ignited because of the connection between Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood and because of the defiance of Hamas to uh, obey any kind of political obligations by the Egyptian side. These kind of contradictions and um, differences between them have a negative impact on the whole population of the Gaza Strip. This is why Egypt have closed the main crossing point <clears throat> and have blocked um, Gaza from its side. This suffocates the economy and people and make life miserable for most people, in, if not all people in the Gaza Strip. Yeah. But if you talk about Gaza, about Palestinians in Gaza, we as Palestinians do not have kind of any problem with the Egyptian side and we believe people, academics, faction in that the Palestinians would stand with the Egyptian people, would stand with the Egyptian army to defend the Egyptian side despite the accusation, despite the, the negative implications were made and connotations so, were made. So, Dr. Bassous, because uh, what we are seeing here basically is that um, the, Ga the, the Egypt doesn't support the regime in the Gaza Strip. It doesn't support the people who are controlling the Gaza Strip, which means that maybe the message that Egypt is sending to the people in the Gaza Strip that is as long as Hamas will control the Gaza Strip, you are not going to get any help from us. Yes, this is the fact that uh, Egypt is sending a strong message to the people of Gaza that as long as Hamas is in control, Egypt will keep blocking the Gaza Strip. And this is a message we have seen. It. It's not only today, for the past many months. This is something clear. But things will not change. Hamas understand the fact and people in Gaza understand the fact. But Hamas will stand as it is, will not change its mind. And the Egyptian regime will not change its position towards Gaza. And we still, we live in a limbo in between. We cannot understand where we're going to go to. It's a difficult situation, and the Egyptian side will not ease. The crossing point will not help the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip as long as Hamas is still in power. Doctor, uh, Dr. Bassous, what are the chances that we will see an uprise in the Gaza Strip in the next few months from well, the people uh, in the Gaza Strip? Yeah, Lucy, um, I understand how difficult life in Gaza, and I live in the Gaza Strip, and many people would like to leave it. It's not, I'm not talking about the poor people. I'm talking about elites. I'm talking about some people who are, are rich academics. They want to leave Gaza because it does not sound like a life. It sounds like a hell. Um, so 
So, but at the same time, you cannot talk about uprising because uh, it's really difficult to speak about something like this. Uh, uprising means that we're going to go nowhere. We will not achieve anything because people would be in confrontation with Hamas and and I don't think any solution would be real. Well, people are, are scared. People are afraid to, to, to go against the people in Hamas, although they know that Hamas is starting to lose power. Well, you say Or maybe that, lost Hamas power for a long time now. Well, Hamas is still in power, still in control anyway. It has not lost. It was weakened after the war, which was last year. A 50 day war, but still Hamas is strong, is still in power, and I think people uh, want to keep at least some kind of stability, even though life is so difficult and so miserable in Gaza. But people want to keep some kind of stability because they don't know what can happen. If the, if the clashes or the uprising begin, no one knows what next would be, what the next step would be. We might be living in a good situation and we don't know, even though it, it's a hell, it's miserable. But uprising might lead to a bloody situation, and this is what keeps people away from kind of a bloody yes. confrontation. Yes, uh, Dr. Hani Basus, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, always, for your phone calls with us. They cannot. They're, like he said, they are in a catch-22. Totally. And I think that what happens in Gaza Strip today, it's quite awful, I must say. I mean, just think about this, that the donor countries promised $5.4 billion. Nothing arrived Gaza. Nothing. And the Egyptians are not helping with the reconstructing of, of Gaza. The PA is not enthusiastic about insisting about assisting that, meaning the Gaza Strip is stay, still in the same situation now. I know that some elements, some people would go and blame Israel in, again. Okay. But Israel is the one that is allowing the construction materials to go into Gaza. The problem is that the people of Gaza doesn't, don't have the money to go and buy the construction materials in order to reconstruct the houses. And yes, we, we should not forget that there is Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, even including today Qatar, which used to be a friend of the, the Gazans. Turkey is not there anymore, meaning that um, Gaza is totally isolated from the world, not just Israel and Egypt. They have no any way to, to get assistance neither directly nor indirectly. Um, in, in this way, yes, they are uh, in a catch-22, uh, uh, a perfect example of, of it. Um, how to get out of it? Well, the problem is, is, is that the, um, the, the silent masses are irrelevant. And, and Hamas, I... in that case, is a strong as it used to be, and, and there is no competition. I will stop you here because, uh, yes, there is no competition, unfortunately. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much uh, for being with me in this part. We're going out for a small break, two minutes, and I'll be back. Developments in Egypt. President Abdel Fattah Sisi's face off with terror groups steps up after a court blacklists the armed wing of Hamas. Meanwhile, after 400 days, Al Jazeera journalist Peter Gresta is released back to Australia. Japan is in shock and condemnations all over after the apparent beheading of a Japanese hostage by IS and with a Jordanian pilot still in the hands of the terror group. Jordan vows to do all in its power to set him free. Israel elections 2015 critiques from the right wing claims the Democratic Party is intervening against Netanyahu. But I-24 News discovers the right wing itself getting help from Republican advisors. Welcome back. The Jordanian government today vowed to rid the country of terrorism following the murder of a second Japanese hostage by the IS. Meanwhile, Japan struggles to make sense of the tragedy and works out its next steps. I'm, I, I'm in six -Sick has more. To the Japanese government, you, like your foolish allies in the satanic coalition. Following the release of a video purporting to show the beheading of a second Japanese hostage by the IS, 
The Jordanian government Sunday condemned the terrorist group. The Jordanian government strongly condemns the terrorist group IS for the killing of the Japanese hostage, the journalist Kenji Goto. Kenji Goto's family also addressed the media following his killing. I had hoped to give thanks for his return alive, but as his brother, this outcome is very regrettable. I am very grateful to the government of Japan, the foreign ministry, people all over Japan and around the world for their support. The IS had wanted to trade Goto for an Iraqi militant, Sajid al-Rashawi, imprisoned in Jordan for a terrorist attack that killed 60 people. The Jordanian government said it's still ready to swap the militant for a Jordanian pilot held by the IS. The pilot, Flight Lieutenant Moaz al qasasbe was seized by IS fighters after his jet crashed while conducting a bombing mission near the Syrian stronghold of Raqqa on December 24th. Back in Japan, the public reaction to the brutal development may put the country's pacifist policy to the test. This really pains my heart and I was hoping to the very end that his life would be saved. It is so sad. I want to express my condolences. They are using religion and taking slaves, which is a system that I think is totally unnecessary. And I think it is unnecessary to kill as well. Lives should not be wasted because all of this. So let the nightmare for Japan begin. Yes, and with me now is former Israeli ambassador to Egypt, Yitzhak Lebanon. Uh, good evening, Ambassador Lebanon. Good evening, Lucy. So, Ambassador Lebanon, putting Japan into the ISIS business, what does it mean? Well, this is a signal sent by IS uh, to all the foreigners who are uh, helping the coalition against them, uh, directly or indirectly. Japan is helping this coalition. Egypt is within the coalition. You have Europe within the coalition. This is why we have seen, you know, as you, you know, Europeans have been beheaded, and, and now this is the turn of the Japanese. Uh, this is this is revolting. This is, you know, something which no normal society can accept it. I think that those people of the IS, they became blind, you know, by this fanaticism, and this is why the Japanese, exactly like the Europeans, they do not understand this mentality that, uh, you know. Uh, you send a threat to these people that you are going to cut their head, and they do it. Not the first one, and not the second one. Uh, Can you negotiate with them? Should you negotiate with look, them? Look, the Jordanians have tried to negotiate, and they are still in these negotiations. Uh, secondly, the IS have asked the Japanese to pay $200 million, $100 million to each head of the, of, of the Japanese. But the Jordanian, for instance, they have tried directly and indirectly. But I think that the Egyptian, and this is the difference, they have some, someone, a woman, you know, in prison. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think that the Jordanian approach, although the IS is unexpected, but there is still, there is a slim chance that this can happen and be saved. Because the Jordanians say quite clearly to the IS, as soon as you will kill our prisoner, uh, be sure that your prisoner will be killed immediately. Probably this is the, the, the style, this is the language, which is it, it's revolting me, but this is the, this is, this is the language. So if this is the language to speak with them, explain to me why this time they're claiming money. Uh, because until, at least at the first beheadings, they didn't claim money. They, they only just send a message. Now they are starting to claim money like the... the, the the last scenes that we're seeing in Homeland. Well, first of all, I don't think that they can ask anything else from the Japanese. Look, this is not the United States, which the hatred is much more deep because the United States are sending, you know, the airplanes. Uh, or, or, or the Gulf state are sending the, the women, you know, the pilots. Uh, Japan is not sending the airplanes. They are helping indirectly. So the only thing is they can ask for money. And always money is good. They have to pay money. You know how much they pay for each one of these elements? It's $1,000 a month for each one of these Daesh or IS people. This is a good salary. So yes. they need this money. Yeah, to say the least. Uh, Ambassador Lebanon, thank you. My condolences, much. you know, to the Japanese people. Yes, definitely. Our condolences to the Japanese and to the Japanese family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,
killing seven and injuring a dozen. Boko Haram ha are now aiming to uh, seizing key uh, cities in northern Nigeria. But today, the terror group met fierce resistance. The assault marks a potential turning point as Nigeria and its neighbors form a coalition to face the ongoing threat. I-24 News reporter Shahal Pellet has the story. For the third time in just one week, and only two weeks before national elections, Boko Haram strikes again. A suicide bomb attack targeting a political meeting killed seven people in northeast Nigeria's Potiskum city. According to the local military, the assault was part of a plan to take over the key northeastern Nigerian city of Meiduguri and was eventually repelled. The terrorist attack on Maiduguri in the early hours of Sunday was quickly contained. The terrorists incurred massive casualty. The situation is calm as mopping up operation in the affected area is ongoing. Meanwhile, regional efforts to combat the Islamists intensify. Four directly affected countries, Cameroon, Chad, Niger and Nigeria, agreed to boost cooperation to contain the threat. Troops from Chad have driven Boko Haram fighters from a northern Nigeria border town seized by the Islamist militants late last year, and Cameroonians held a march to support the fight against the radical militant group. It affects everyone, not just the Cameroonian people. It concerns the whole world. Terrorism is a social, political and economic problem. So we decided to march in support of our country and the world against terrorism. The African Union has endorsed a plan to set up a regional task force of 7,500 people backed by the UN to fight the Islamists. Meanwhile, Boko Haram has expanded its zone of operations over the past year, most notably into northern Cameroon. The group also controls large swathes of territory across northeastern Nigeria, with the country's military having failed to stop the worsening six-year insurgency, which has killed more than 13,000 thus far and forced over a million people to flee their homes. Yes, and now turning to the elections in Israel, now less than two months away with me, Zai24 News correspondent Eli Ochenberg. Good evening with a um, specific story. Yes, specific is a great uh, term. <laughs> well, we've been closely following uh, Israeli election and, and maybe the most, uh, the hottest topic of recent weeks is the is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu being invited by uh, Republican Joan Boehner to carry out a speech in Congress, something that raised a massive uproar both in the U.S., and in Israel, and, and, and pointing on a very uh, problematic issue, the involvement and connection of the Dem uh, Democratic and uh, Republican parties in Israeli elections. And tonight, we'll reveal yet another aspect of this problematic connection. But first of all, let's see the report. Let's see. Thank you. A public campaign calling to change the Israeli political leadership is creating chaos as right-wing parties with the ruling Likud party in the vanguard slam what they term illegal cooperation between the U.S. Democratic Party and the Israeli left wing. The law doesn't allow foreign entities to donate to parties because foreign citizens are donating to corporations or organizations. Those donate to the parties. There's an illegal connection that Herzog knows from the first nonprofits of there. And, as he was silent there, he is doing the same thing again. The group behind the campaign, V15, is a civil organization dedicated to bringing political change in Israel, partnered with One Voice Israel, which works with Israelis and Palestinians to lobby their political leadership to bring about a two-state solution. The Likud argues that V15's activities are breaking campaign finance laws using foreign funds to promote political propaganda. The Likud can say whatever they want. If you repeat a lie again and again and again, it doesn't make it true. V15 is a campaign that comes from Israelis that uh, are working alone with their ideas and their enthusiasm and their motivation. It has nothing to do to foreign policies or to other uh, resources. But more than this, right-wing entities claim the campaign is backed by none other than U.S. administration officials from the Democratic Party with the aim of toppling Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Not a far-fetched idea after the scandal caused by Netanyahu's planned speech in Congress. Their main argument revolves around the fact that One Voice Israel, the partner of V15, is using a consulting firm led by Jeremy Byrd, a former national field director for the 2012 Obama campaign. But I-24 News discovered it's not only the Israeli left wing getting American assistance, but the right wing Likud party itself. 
Vincent Harris is an American conservative political strategist considered to be a Republican Party's new media wonder child. He's worked with Senator Ted Cruz, an avid critic of President Obama. Interestingly, three weeks ago, Harris posted the following picture on his Instagram account. Indeed, he was in Israel advising the Likud party's new media team, something the party confirmed. American advisors' involvement in Israeli elections has become a hot topic, but it seems both sides may get burned. Look, 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 look. <laughs> when I'm pointing a finger at you, I might find four directed to me. That's exactly the story. But let, let's go back to the turning point when Boehner invited Netanyahu to uh, arrive to the U.S. Congress without consulting on or even informing uh, U.S. President Barack Obama, what obviously triggered a severe dispute, uh, 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 raising rumors and stories that the U.S. administration wants to oust Netanyahu, that the administration uh, sees the Israeli ambassador to Washington, Ron Dremmer, as a fan of Netanyahu, et cetera, et cetera, but with one main conclusion, any sorts of attempt by the Democratic Party to get involved in Israeli elections will eventually benefit Netanyahu himself. And indeed, surprise, surprise, the second there was any indication that the, uh, that the uh, Democratic Party is involved with the Israeli left wing, the right wing, and the Likud lashed out uh, in a very predictable and yet inevitable way. Uh, uh, but tonight we reveal that not only uh, there is a connection between the Democratic uh, Party and the Israeli left wing, but also between the Likud, Netanyahu himself, with the Republican Party, which uh, have obviously their own uh, interest uh, uh, in American politics. So what's the difference between Republican uh, Harris and Democratic Byrd, both of them advising Israeli fractions? I'm not sure there's any difference. You know, what surprises me in all this this is um, that really someone thought that no one will uh, see it coming or no one will see the connection? No, it's amazing. It's a, it's, a, it's a very weird story, but this is politics. Double standard, you said, I said, I said. <laughs> thank you very, thank much. You very much. And we're moving on. Another attack on Donetsk in eastern Ukraine today as fighting intensified between Ukrainian armed forces and pro-Russian rebels. At least one person was killed today, but hopes for a peaceful agreement were crushed the day before when peace talks between the parties collapsed within hours. Ayman Siksik has the details. Shells pounded the eastern Ukraine rebel-held city of Donetsk Sunday, killing at least one person just a day after peace talks between a Ukrainian envoy and pro-Russian separatists collapsed. The past 24 hours have seen widespread clashes with Russian-backed separatists, and Kiev says 13 Ukrainian soldiers and at least seven civilians have been killed in the fighting. The civilian and military death toll has mounted in the past two weeks, after rebels launched a new offensive. We all will stay and defend ourselves. We are not leaving, all of us. We're living here and bracing ourselves. They have attacked us. Ukraine, Russia and separatist envoys met for peace talks in Minsk, Belarus on Saturday. But the talks ended without any agreement for a new ceasefire and with the sides exchanging blame for the collapse of the talks. We are ready for a dialogue and ready to act in the framework of Minsk agreements. But we need a dialogue, not Ukraine's monologue. And we need absence of their ultimatums and some positions that will be acceptable for all the sides. But less than one day after the talks fell apart, after only four hours, heavy shelling could again be heard in Yanakiev, another embattled town in eastern Ukraine. And now to economy. And with me is Shmuel Bentovim, president of Bentovim Consultants LTD. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Good evening. So uh, just uh, last week we spoke about Greece and the implication that it will have on the EU. And it seems that uh, Greece is not uh, really in a hurry to leave the EU. I don't think they want to leave the EU. They would like the EU to play according to their terms. Uh, I don't think that the EU will be responding so quickly. Uh, I think that in spite of the situation of Greece, which is, of course, not a reason for celebration, no one wants to see the EU falling apart, even with one country, because then another can follow. So there is a strong sentiment in the EU 
including the leaders, that they w wish so Greece explain to stay. Me why to yell above your capabilities? Why to make noise when you actually need the EU? Okay, there is some, of course, emotions here and some uh, national pride and patriotism, and that's probably what brought the results of the, the, these elections. You can say that every election is emotional, but okay. this was even more than others, and people were felt humiliated by all the sanctions and all the steps that they forced to take by the EU, maybe very justified, but still left them with a very bitter taste. And that's what brought the, the results. So uh, if we want to make like a grocery list, what uh, the grocery list of the Greek, uh, the Greek people that are putting on the table for, uh, for the Europeans? Of course, the Greek people or the Greek government will like to see a further haircut, as we call it, more moratorium of, of debts, in addition to what they've already enjoyed in the last uh, agreement. Uh, they would like to keep uh, the good life without uh, paying for it, to say it uh, very simply. Can they ask this? Uh, they, 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 like, can, uh, they can ask this, but it, can it be complete? Can it be achieved? Look, I think that uh, being an Israeli, I'll, I'll take a very, uh, maybe not humble step and take us back 30 years. In 1985, Israel was in about the same situation very high inflation, high unemployment, very low reserves. We were at the brink of, uh, of bankruptcy. And uh, the government, together with the Americans at that time, took very, very severe steps that were extremely hurtful to the trade unions and everyone, and we got out of it. So, so that's so the lesson. Exactly, the lesson is there is a price. This, Israel, until today, cannot uh, handle itself without the United States. Can Greek handle itself without Germany? I don't think it's true. Israel can handle itself very well without the United States. It's doing extremely well in its exports and its foreign investments. Uh, the UK, the EU, uh, and U USA is... Uh, uh, I will say helping head is, is a kind of an insurance policy. It not allows Israel to exist. Israel is, is self-sufficient, uh, which you can't say about Greece with her 175 of GDP foreign debt and high unemployment, and they, they can't handle yeah. their own affairs, uh, so they are dependent and they have to admit it. Yes, I, I said uh, that uh, we can't... Uh, uh leave ourselves without the United States and other perspectives than now money. That's but, maybe uh, not yes. economically. That's and a, a different uh, yeah, issue. Yeah, yes. definitely. Shmuel uh, Bentovima, thank you very, very much. Uh, for thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Will the total abortion ban finally be lifted in Chile? President uh, Michel Bachelet uh, has uh, tabled a bill in Congress to legalize abortion in cases of rape or when there is a threat to the mother's or baby's life. But her groundbreaking proposal faces harsh opposition in the conservative Roman Catholic country. I-24 News reporter Shahal Pelad has the story. A decades-old taboo in one of Latin America's most socially conservative countries is soon to be changed. Chile's president, Michel Bachelet, has signed a bill intended to decriminalize abortion, but only in certain cases. When a mother's life is at risk or the life she gestates is unviable or the result of sexual violence, it touches on ethical principles, rights and humanitarian concerns. Abortion of any type has been strictly outlawed in Chile since 1989, one of the only seven countries in the world that bans it under any circumstances. These mostly include the conservative Catholic Latin American countries such as El Salvador, the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua. In Chile, abortion is punishable by up to five years in jail. 30-year-old Maria is one of the many women in Chile who decided to get an abortion illegally. I was scared I would go to prison because I didn't have any insurance, so I couldn't go to a private clinic. I had to go to the hospital, and there I could have been denounced. Now Chilean President Bachelet, a qualified pediatrician who formerly served as the director of the UN's Gender Equality Division, is saying it is not acceptable to imprison these women. 
The facts show us that the absolute prohibition and criminalization of any kind of abortion have not prevented its practice in conditions that are dangerous for women's lives and health. Previous proposals have been voted down by the legislator, and even though polls say most Chileans support the new abortion terms, these too face great opposition and might be rejected in Congress. But Bachelet, who already initiated groundbreaking reforms in the conservative country, such as modernizing the education system and allowing civil unions for same-sex couples, is planning to press ahead and bring about change in women and liberty rights. Before going back to Israel, IT4 News correspondent Uli Shapira traveled to Amona, a small outspot in the West Bank, nine years after the evacuation of nine houses there sparked controversy in Israel. Now, when the High Court has decided to evacuate the entire outspot, the head of Amona and a candidate for the Jewish Home Party, Avishai Baron, is pointing blame at the authorities who backed the settlers in the past. Avichai Boaron, the chairman of Amona headquarters, will never forget February 1, 2006, when thousands of police officers evacuated and demolished nine houses in the small Jewish outpost located in the heart of the West Bank. The evacuation was carried out after the Israeli High Court ruled that the houses were built on Palestinian land. It took place only several months after Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip another stinging defeat for the settlers and the right wing. Thousands of people came to support the settlers of Amona. As a result, more than 200 people were wounded, including 80 security officers. Even nine years later, Boaron justifies the settlers' actions against the authorities. I saw two military officials and I told them, listen, if you won't take a step back, there will be casualties. We didn't plan it. We were like a child who fights against his father, who tries to take something from his hands, and the kid knows that his father will succeed, but still he stomps his legs. We didn't know where it will end. Unfortunately for Boaron, the High Court issued an even harsher ruling several weeks ago that the entire outpost must be evacuated within two years. The decision was taken after a long and fierce legal battle led by the Yesh Din Human Rights Organization, which represented Palestinians who claimed the land on which Amona was built was taken from them by force in the mid-1990s. The state presented um, aerial photos from the first part of the 90s and the 80s, uh, proving uh, that the, uh, the area was cultivated by the Palestinian orders. However, Boaron says the lands were deserted when the Jewish settlers arrived. The lands were not stolen from anyone. No one was here before we showed up. As you can see behind me, the hills are empty. After losing his campaign in court, Boaron tried to find another way to save the outpost. He ran for a spot on the list of candidates for the Jewish home, a party which calls for the annexation of Area C in the West Bank. But he only made number 17 on the list, considered possibly not high enough to put him in parliament after the March 17 elections. Nevertheless, Boron still believes he and his friends can keep his home. Zionism is stronger than a false court decision. The traumatic images of 2006 still echo in the hills of Amona. It seems unavoidable that similar, if not even stronger images may appear in 2016. But none of this worries Boron and his friends who continue to stand on this high hill, in their view, above the Supreme Court. And now to sports. Yes, and with me is the host of i24 News Sports Magazine, Jonathan Rege. Good evening. Good evening to you too. Uh, we just discovered that we studied in this, like, together in the university, but we didn't pay attention to yes, one another. Yes, yes. How Li come? Little did we know that yeah. three or four years later... Unbelievable. 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 And now we're working in I-24 News. Yes, yes. So, so studies paid off. Yes, of course. Yes, they of did. Of course, like uh, it's always pays off. Let's talk about the Super Bowl. Super Bowl Sunday! Of course. Super Bowl Sunday. The Super Bowl is just about four and a half hours away. Um, the um, Seattle Seahawks uh, on one side, New, Eng uh, New England Patriots on the other side. Very, very interesting matchups. The Seahawks are the current champions in American sports as opposed to European sports. A team winning two, two Super Bowls in a row, it doesn't happen a lot. 
And, and yet uh, the Seahawks, they're one of the strongest teams. They're the champions, and they have a very, very strong defense. Don't count them, uh, don't count them out yet. In the final of the NFC, they were supposed to lose, but they made a heroic, excellent comeback, and they're in the Super Bowl. And the Patriots, they won three, three Super Bowls in the past um, 15 years. Will they win uh, number four? Tom Brady, one of the greatest American quarterbacks. Oh. The answer is in about four, five, six hours. Five, six hours from now. When most of us will be sleeping. Some of us Here will be Israel. watching Super Bowl. Here in Israel. In America, no in one America, will be sleeping because no the, there's sleep. halftime show, there's commercials. They have yes. to watch that. We will be waiting for the commercials, of course. Yes. And let's talk about the Australian Open. Australian Open, the world number one, Novak Djokovic. Uh, he won the Australian Open. He beat Andy Murray. Now, the story be this between Djokovic and Murray is very interesting. They met each other three times in the Australian Open final. Djokovic won all of them. They met in other two Grand Slam finals, one in Wimbledon, one in Flushing Meadows. There, Murray won it. Meaning, if you want, to, Andy, Mr. Murray, if you want to beat Djokovic in a Grand Slam final, don't don't face him in Melbourne because it's uh, what, what can you do? Let's there we see him, Novak Djokovic. Um, there we see him, world number one, and um, won the Australian Open. And I give you one word about rugby. Six Nations uh, trophy begins this coming Friday, and there's a new trophy, a new cup. Why? Because the previous cup used to be the Five Nation Cup. The, okay. The, but it changed to Six Nations 15 years ago when Italy joined the competition. So it took them 15 years to make a new trophy with the Sixth Nation. 15 years it took them to... Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Um, uh, nice. Amazing. <laughs> they, they, uh, <laughs> at, at least, at, least at, at a certain point it sunk you in. You know what interests me? What? Uh, how much did you get in statistics? <laughs> less than you, I'm sure. I was busy. I was making social contacts or no, something. No, no, believe me. Not less than me. <laughs> Jonathan Regev, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go out for a break. Two minutes and I'll be back.